So welcome back. We have been talking about agents and knowledge and reasoning, making inferences. So here is an example which again illustrates the kind of thing one has to do. So imagine that you are a striker uh, for a football team and you are running towards the opponent goal with the ball. So your team is shown in blue here and the opponent's team is shown in red here. So you are running forward with the ball and as you can see other players are closing in towards you. Uh, one defender and one goalkeeper is also coming towards you. And in this situation, you have to make decisions. So, that is what we are talking about that autonomous agents in some world, some domain has a goal to achieve. So, when you say a goal to achieve, we mean an objective not so much as the goal in football and a set of actions to choose from to strive for this goal. Essentially. So, an agent has to you know be very aware of what is happening. It must have a representation of its domain in its head. It must have representation of what other agents are doing and it must have access to what are the strategies and plans that people use in this situation. And based on all that you take a decision. So, what would you do? You would possibly hit the ball not towards a goal, but to a different region where your teammate is heading towards and that your teammate may have a better chance at scoring that goal. So, if this were to happen, then you know one would definitely say that the player is intelligent actually. But you make a lot of abductive inferences when you are doing that. If you are running with the ball in a football game, you must be aware of where the other players are. So, that is a case for modeling the domain in which you are operating and what they intend to do. So, you must be able to make inferences of what other players are likely to do and intention can be guessed if you know what are the standard ways in people act, what are the standard plans that people use in different situations. If you are aware of that and if you see some action which is part of that plan, then you can make an inference of what their intention is or what their goal is if you want to say. This inference of intention comes from background knowledge. You must be knowing, you should know for example, you know what do people do in football games. That is why you know games have coaches uh, uh, and they keep studying the uh, moves of opposing teams and they keep making strategies and plans and so on essentially. This kind of knowledge that a player uses on the field comes from training. You should be able to imagine that if you kick the ball to where your teammate should be running to, then he would have a better shot at the goal. This ability to imagine is a key aspect of intelligent behavior. You cannot imagine you cannot think of intelligent agents which cannot imagine what will happen if they do certain actions essentially. So, to be able to do that, of course, they must have access to a lot of knowledge as to what is the domain they are operating in and what are the possibilities of actions that they have and what would be the consequences of those actions. And also in multi-agent games like football, what the other players might be doing essentially. So, the opponents no doubt are thinking about that too. Why is that opposing team player running towards the spot? Because she has also figured out that you have an intention of passing the ball to your teammate and she would like to block that essentially. So, making inferences, inference is a basic cognitive act for intelligent minds. We are all the time making inferences. Some of them may be true, some of them may not be true, but all the time we have flights of fancy, flights of imagination uh, and you know making sense of what we are seeing by inferring other things essentially. 
So, in this recently published book called The Myth of Artificial Intelligence, the author Eric Larson says that most of the inferences that we make as humans are abductive in nature essentially. Because most of the time we are confronted with some situation and we have background knowledge and then we make inferences essentially. Abduction is like guesswork essentially that okay, this is what could be the reason for whatever you are seeing, some action or event or whatever. So, abduction is guesswork based on what we know about the world and some people make more informed guesses than others essentially. So, maybe people like Sherlock Holmes make better guesses and so on. Now, whenever we are making inferences, we are talking about expectations essentially. Abductive inferences generate expectations that you expect to see something. So, if you see dark clouds, then you expect that it might rain essentially. So, on a football field for example, uh, you may make inferences about what is the goalkeeper expected to do, what, what about your teammate, what are the opponent, opposing team players likely to do. So, you generate expectations of all these and then based on that, you kind of monitor your own activity, your own plan and if necessary, do a change of course and you know maybe choose a different plan. So, all that happens very dynamically and very quickly. So, these kind of inferences of course, have to be done very quickly. Now, there are something called garden path sentences. So, if you read this sentence, the old man's glasses, you may expect something, but suddenly you read the rest of the sentence and that expectation is kind of violated in the sense that when you talk about the old man's glasses, you maybe were thinking of reading glasses or spectacles or something like that, but then suddenly you find that they were filled with sherry. So, your word sense about what you meant by glasses has changed. You started when you are reading the sentence, you had an expectation that it will be something to do, maybe his glasses were broken or maybe his glasses were lost or whatever, but suddenly you read the rest of the sentence and you are, are filled with a little bit of a surprise essentially because of the fact that you had generated expectations. and that expectation was violated and then you had to revise of how you understood the sentence essentially. So, jokes depend upon such expectation violations essentially and expectations cannot be like deductions. So, that is what we are trying to say that abductive inferences you make, you, you imagine a lot of possibilities, but that does not mean that they will necessarily happen essentially. So, here is a, a joke also from Sherlock Holmes, but not by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This kind of illustrates that when you are making inferences, then there is such a sea of choices and ocean of possibilities that you have to choose from that it is not always easy to even make the most obvious ones. So, here is a, here's a, here's a story. So, according to this which is narrated by somebody else. Holmes and Watson are on a camping trip. In the middle of the night, Holmes wakes up and gives Dr. Watson a nudge. Watson, he says, look up in the sky and tell me what you see. Watson says, I see a million stars. Holmes, then Holmes asks him, and what do you conclude from that Watson? So, Watson gives you a long explanation. He says, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. Theologically, I see that God is all powerful and we are small and in insignificant. What does it tell you, Holmes? And Holmes says, Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. So, you can see that when you were reading the story, you did not expect something like this. And that is how jokes operate essentially. They lead you up to some this thing and then they present something slightly different to you. Now, there was this school uh, of thought. Uh, at Yale University, Roger Shank and his group, they did a lot of work on expectations and they wrote programs to understand stories and uh, 
stories in English and uh, they used uh, a mechanism to generate expectations to understand those stories. So, let us see an example given by Roger Shank in his book. Read this story and then we will discuss it. Okay, so, we have held back the climax for you, but you know that after reading all this stuff, this conversation between Fred and John, the listener who is reading this or you for example, has some expectations as to what is it that John is about to say. Now, clearly John is upset with Mary and he is asking for her knife, so it could mean anything. Where do this expectation comes from? Shank says that expectations they come from various sources. One is from the syntax and the semantics of the text that you are talking about. That you expect, when he says I think I ought to, you expect some kind of a verb which will talk about some action and things like that. Then a conceptual structure which represents something which uh, is like an action and a type of filler for it essentially. So, we will see this a little bit when we look at Shank's work later uh, is that they hypothesize st structures which they call as conceptual structures and those conceptual structures had some information put into them and there were some gaps and those gaps basically generated the expectations. And so, you will look for something which will fill that gap. A gap is like a blank essentially. The context will tell you as to what to expect. The conceptual structure predicts an action. Context delimits the range of possible actions, for example, end relationship, hurt someone, go to some place, emote. These are the kind of reactions you would expect when you see that people have had a fight and are angry with someone. Essentially. Conversational. Very often people do to, for example, gain sympathy or to inform about intent and so on essentially. So, people talk for a reason essentially because they want to communicate something. So, there is a conversational expectation that John is going to say something uh, which uh, may be important. It also depends on what do you know about John. If John is known to be a convicted murderer, then you would know that handing him the knife is not a great idea. But on the other hand, if he were to be an avowed, avowed pacifist, then you may have different expectations. So, expectations come from various things. They come from the structure of utterances, they come from the context, they come from world knowledge, they come from the fact that conversation is are done for certain purpose, they come from the world view of the listener about what you know about this person. And what is accepted within the culture essentially. So, different cultures have different things. So, Roger Shank asked as to what kind of knowledge structures in memory would generate such expectations that if you are listening to a story, how would a program be able to say ok, this is what I expect to see next. Now, if you got something like I think I ought to go and eat some fish, then you would be very surprised essentially. And as we have said, the jokes exploit such violation of expectations. You were not expecting him to say that, oh, you give me a knife, I want to go and eat some fish. Uh, so, what is important is that we do generate expectations uh, when we listen to stories and we are interested in knowing as to what kind of knowledge in the heads of the agents would be useful in generating such expectations. So, let us take a break at this point and we will come back and continue our discussion.